Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! This is the Japan Archives, episode 17b, Hitobashira. We'll be looking into the old beliefs of Hitobashira this week, and for the poet, we'll have one by a man called Saigyo Hoshi. So how are you today, Heather? I'm doing really good, except I have to do a speech tomorrow in one of my classes. In Japanese? In Japanese. Okay. So I'm a little nervous, but I'm all right. <laughs> what are you talking about? Don't laugh. I'm talking about Chiko-chan. <laughs> I'm not gonna laugh. I know you like Chiko-chan and she's, what's the word? She's very informative, so there's nothing wrong with talking about her. I, I do like a lot of the facts. I've learned so much and I, I really have learned a lot by listening, um, just listening to all of the Japanese and reinforcing some of the things I've learned and learning new words. So, yeah. Well, good luck and let me know how it goes. Thank you so much. Will do. <laughs> So this week, we're carrying on from last one. Last week we did human sacrifice. So this week I wanted to talk about the practice of Hito Bashira. It's very similar in that it is a form of human sacrifice. It's one of those things, again, like we said, there's no archaeological evidence for it ever happening on, well, in Japan. But we do have a lot of tales and stories surrounding the belief. It's thought that these legends were probably spread around Japan by female shamans known as Miko, who took part in rituals to basically placate the water deities, these being called Suijin. Now, do you happen to know what Hitobashira would mean in English? I'm assuming Hito is people? Yes. I... Bashira? Bashira. Hmm. I don't know that one. <laughs> okay. So the Bashira in this context would translate to something like pillar so it's translating to like a human pillar oh so basically this old belief was that in times when large constructions were being built such as bridges and castles and moats and things like that it would often be the case that someone would be sacrificed to aid in the strengthening of the foundation and the earliest mentionings we have of this practice come from the reign of Nintoku, and we can find these in the Nihongi, one of the old chronicles of Japan, which we've mentioned quite a lot in previous episodes. So the story goes that in the winter of the 10th month, there was a plain north of the palace which was being excavated, and the water from the south was being diverted into the western sea. And basically, in order to prevent the overflowing of these rivers and all, on all this area, an embankment was constructed, an embankment called the Mamuta Embankment. During the construction, there were parts of it which, keep, which kept giving way, like they couldn't get the foundation strong enough to remain, so the water, it just kept washing it away. So the emperor one night, he has a dream, where he's basically told off by one of the gods. And the god says to the emperor, there are two men that need to be found. One is named Kohakubi, and the other man is called Koromo no Ko. What he asks is for these two men to be sacrificed to the river god so that they may continue building these embankments. So the emperor, he sends out for these two men to be found, these two men to be located, and having found them, he then goes to sacrifice them to this river god. It's said that Kohakubi weeps and laments, but plunges himself in the water and sacrifices himself, so that one embankment on one side of the river could be completed. So on the other embankment where Koromo no Ko is, he does not throw himself into the river, and instead he throws two whole calabashes onto the surface of the river. And calabash in this context is like a type of god, so it floats on top of the river. What he does, he prays to the river god, saying that, O oh, river god who has sent this curse to me, I have now come as a sacrifice. If you do wish to continue to have me sacrifice, you must sink these calabashes that I have thrown into the river and not let them rise to the surface. Then I shall know that you are a true god, and I will jump into the water of my own accord and sacrifice myself. However, if you cannot sink these calabashes, I of course will know that you are a false god. And if you are a false god, then why should I sacrifice my life in vain? 
So what happened to Whirlwind is then said to have appeared on top of the river, and the Calabashers were tried to be drowned in the river. The god tried to submerge them. However, these gods would not sink and floated away, and because of this, the god was shown to be a false god, and so the embankment was completed. Koromo managed to not sacrifice himself, because he proved the god was false, the constructions could continue, and there was no longer a supernatural power which could destroy the embankment. And that is the first instance we know of the practice of Hitobashira, so of the human sacrifice for these constructions. So it's unfortunate that one of the men did sacrifice himself, to allow the construction of one embankment, but the other one, through his intelligence and manipulation, managed to prove the god was a false god, and yeah, because of that, the god lost their power, and so the embankment could be constructed. Well, there is a lot There's a lot going on in that story, because... Yeah, there was quite a lot happening. I'm going to try to break down... This is an interesting story, and I, I like that you're finding... I like that you're finding stories where people are using wit and intelligence to escape their fate. Yes. I'm, I feel like I'm going to not explain this right. Let me see if I can make it clear. Good luck to me. A lot of times it feels that many people say that, oh, my fate and my destiny are determined. I can't change them. And I feel that prevalent in you know, many cultures, to be honest, the stories you're finding are people who are saying, nope, I'm, that's not my fate. That's not, it could be my fate. It could be my destiny, but I should do some action. They're not just sitting and passively accepting. There's, there's action involved. There is an effort to, if not change destiny, but see if that, that course is truly the course they're meant to take. I can definitely see it. In the story I just told, yeah, there mm. was one person who was like, why should I kill myself for you? And of course, like, he was like, if you are a god, of course, I understand, you have power, I will gladly give my life. But if you are just a being who is acting like a god, then there is no reason that I should mm. give my life for you. So yeah, like, there was the one guy who sacrificed himself without a thought, because in a way, God willed it. But the other one, no, like you said, it was more of just because you're a God doesn't mean I should do what you say. Well, and I think the story last week too, where it was determined to have the, the fair maiden to be sacrificed, but instead it was challenged. So the two yes. stories back to back, I just noticed the similarity of, oh, well, this is supposed to be your fate. Well, are you sure about that? <laughs> it's the theme for the both stories the past couple of weeks. Mm, definitely. So I, I, I really enjoy that. Uh, the other thing you mentioned was the construction. I, I know uh, it's a future episode I wanted to talk about just because I, I saw it. Honestly, I saw it in a movie and was curious about Well, And actually, I, I think I saw it in real life. Like when houses are being constructed, there's often rights associated with stages of the construction process. So in this instance, it's a, oh, look, it's a construction right. It just happens to be a, a sacrifice as opposed to, you know, just blessing it or throwing seeds or sprinkling water or doing the sutra. Or... So the, the construction rights involved. And then also Calabash. When you said Calabash, interestingly enough, I said, um, there's a <laughs> back where I'm from, the, my, well, my side of the East Coast, there's Calabash style seafood. <laughs> That's in South, around South Carolina uh, area. Okay. And you said calabash. It's like, hmm? You mean like fried shrimp? So I was thinking, well, they threw a calabash into the water. It's like, oh, fried seafood. Oh, huh, that's interesting. It's Japan, you know, tempura. So <laughs> I thought about that. And I didn't know that. Because I, I never heard like the actual definition of calabash. I had no idea it was a gourd. But I don't think back in, in America that calabash is used as a gourd. So I'm, I'm kind of... It's just really interesting to hear that word in a different context. It's interesting that you thought of something else when it came to calabash. But like you said, if seafood would have made sense as it being Japan, but obviously I feel like a god, a god also does make sense. Like you see them a lot in Shinto shrines. I think they use them in crafts too. Like some of the kids in school would make things with gourds. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. So I want you to keep in mind everything you've just said. For the next stories I'm going to tell. Ooh. I feel that I agree with what you were saying with the whole, it's not necessarily your fate, so question it and go against the gods and things like that. But these next stories potentially don't follow that same theme, but we'll see. Okay. So I have 
basically four other places, two bridges and two castles that are associated with the right of Hitobashira. So the first one we have the Nagara Bridge. The story surrounding this comes from a 15th century diary known as the Yasutomi Ki. And according to the tradition, it said that there was a woman who was carrying a boy on her back and she was caught while she was passing along the Nagara River. And because she was captured, and at the time they were trying to build a bridge which kept collapsing because of the water, she was buried at the place where the large bridge was then to be built. So she wasn't given a choice, she was taken instantly and she was offered as a form of sacrifice in the foundations of the Nagara bridge which was then constructed successfully afterwards. The second bridge was known as the Matsue bridge and it said that the daimyo at the time, so the leader of the Izumo province, he had a bridge which needed to be built to cross one of the major rivers. And again, they made numerous attempts, but every time the foundation stones were washed away by the rushing rivers. So word passed around and people began to believe that the spirits of the flood were angry. And so an attempt to appease them was carried out again in the form of a sacrifice. So below the central pillar of the bridge, which is again where the whole word of Hitobashire comes from, you're using a person as a foundation stone or a pillar in the construction of the building. So this person was taken, placed below the central pillar of the bridge, where the water is said to have been the most turbulent. Uh, this man was a man by the name of Gensuke, and he was buried alive. Now it's said that soon after the waters did in fact calm and they were able to finish the construction of the bridge. So the god had been appeased by this sacrifice. Now there's a little bit more to the story which is that to this day if you go to the bridge of Matsue on a moonless night you can often see a mysterious red fire which will shine from the bottom of the pillar. And it's said that these are the angry ghostly remains of Gensuke's ghost. That's different story. You're right. Different to the first one. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially for the first one, it was very short. But the fact that the woman, I feel like she wasn't even told what was happening to her. She was literally, she was there at the, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And she was just taken and used. Mm. And the same with the other one, like Gensuke, it doesn't say how he was chosen to be this sacrifice or if he had a choice in the matter. Yeah, but I was yeah, wondering about that. He was basically that. just taken from his, presumably just from his home and taken to the bridge and sacrificed to appease the god. Now, you said she had a boy on her back as well? Yes. What about the boy? I, di I didn't catch if something, if he was okay or he was part of the bridge as well. So the part of the diary that I did read doesn't mention the boy after the woman is taken, so presumably he is left as a motherless child. Which again relates back to the previous episode when the hunter is confronting the god who takes all the sacrifices. He does ask them why he thinks it's okay to leave so many motherless children. And again, this similar practice of human sacrifice is carrying out the same end goal in that it is creating a lot of motherless children due to this practice. Mm, I'm ready for the next story. I'm ready for the next story. <laughs> okay, so the next two, like I said, are two castles instead. So we had the Matsue Bridge. So the first one is going to be Matsue Castle. This one again is quite a short story. So the story goes that underneath the foundations of the castle, a girl was buried alive. Now this girl had a great love for dancing. She would often be found dancing around the area and it is said that to this day after she was sacrificed for the bury, um, for the construction of the castle, it is said that to this day should a woman or child be found dancing in the streets around the surviving castle, it would call the castle to shake in the girl's raid at being buried alive. So Matsue Bridge and Matsue Castle, they're, I'm assuming they are the same area, correct? Yes. Not a very good place to have gone. Well, either way, it was, it's still not a good place to live. No, no. Two sacrifices were carried out in that area. No, it's not. Hmm. Okay. All right. What's so far? I had a really good story, and then I've had two not as good stories. Okay, Thomas, what have you got for me for the third one? So the last castle is the castle of Maruoka. Now, this castle is one of the oldest surviving castles in Japan, and the story of the Hitobashira practice can be found in the legend of called the Oshizu Hitobashira. So the story goes that a man called Shibata Katsutoyo, who was the nephew of a man called Katsuye, was trying to construct the castle of Maruoka. The stone wall of the castle kept collapsing no matter how many times they 
tried to pile up the stones. One of Katsutoyo's vassals at the time suggested that they could make a human sacrifice as an offering to ensure the foundations of the castle would stay up so they could continue building the castle. Now again, this story relates to a woman. So the woman was called Oshizu, and she's said to have been a one-eyed woman who had two children and lived a poor life. And she was the one who was unfortunately chosen for this practice. So she resolved to agree to this practice on the condition that one of her children be allowed to become a samurai. Hmm. And so they agreed to this, and so she was buried under the central pillar of the castle's keep. And after that, it said the construction of the castle was then successful. Unfortunately, Katsutoyo, after the castle was completed, was transferred to another province, and so her son never reached the rank of samurai. So the promise was broken. And so it said that Oshizu's spirit became very resentful and unrestful. And so every April from then on, she would cause the moat of the castle to overflow with rainwater. And people came to say that this was called this rain was called by the tears of Oshizu's sorrow at her child not becoming a samurai. So to try and appease her, they erected a small tomb nearby for her, which I'm not sure if it worked. The, what I read didn't mention it, and eventually there was also a poem surrounding her sacrifice and her, her tears are causing the moat to overflow, the poem going as follows. The rain which falls when the season of cutting algae comes is the rain reminiscent of the tears of the poor Oshizu sorrow. And there you go, they're the four stories I found surrounding this practice. There are probably others in other books I have or have yet to read, but they're the first four that I came across. Well, the first five I came across. So, yeah, there you go. They're not, they're not cheery, hmm. for sure. Unlike last week where we actually had happy endings, these hmm. ones, not so happy in the long run. No, we had really ha unhappy and then poor oh she's Usan. oh she she sacrificed to try to make her family's life better and even in the end one eye poor life and still oh that poor woman <laughs> yeah thomas um i want to say thank you i will say thank you for your research and very informative stories mm, i'm i'm going to leave it there <laughs> yeah i'm sorry like normally i i i give much more f fun stories or at the very least if they start off sad they have a kind of happy ending but mm -hmm. yeah this week unfortunately no happy endings really well it's like life not everything has a happy ending some are bad some are neutral and some are what so thank you for that mm, reflection upon life you're very welcome i guess I know, me too. <laughs> me too. So I'm hoping then that you can lighten the mood with your poem this week. You managed to find a lighthearted death poem last week by Moria Senan. So can you do the same for us this week? Just like you ended with more sad stories, I unfortunately picked another Jisei, but this one does not have a humorous twist. Let me tell you about the poet. It's Saigyo. Also, I've noticed Saigyo Hoshi, and he was born around 1118 and died in 1190. So he was during the late Heian and early Kamakura period. He was born to a noble family, and he was born Sato Norikyo, but he later took the name, the pen name Saigyo, which means Western Journey. And this is a reference to uh, the Amida Buddha and the Western Paradise. Okay. And he is known for the Sankashu, or the collection of a mountain home, which is his personal poetry collection. Mm. He actually was an inspiration for Basho. So we've got a, another tie to Basho in our poetry. Okay. Now that I know a little bit about Saigyo, um, I'm ready for the poem. I have a pen ready to write down words I might hear because you test me every time. I'll should. I will. I'll test you because now I can test you. Neguwakuwa. Hana no moto ni te, haru shinan, sono kisagari no mochizuki no koro. All right, Thomas, I'm going to test your, uh, well, mostly it's testing my pronunciation. Maybe not your listing, but my pronunciation. <laughs> Did you recognize any words from that poem? So I think I had three words mm. that I recognized. Hmm. One was Hana, but in this context, I'm not sure. You'll have to tell me which one it is. Is it flower or is it nose? You were correct with the flower pronunciation, or the flower interpretation. Hmm. 
Next one, I think I heard mochi. It's mochizuki, but there is mochi in it, but it does not mean mochi. Okay. And the last one, I thought I heard kokoro. Naidis. Not in there.、Ah. So I apologize for my pronunciation. The translation is so you got, you are right on the, huh, you are right on the nose with flower. Sorry. <laughs> so hana, hana, like you said, can mean flower or nose depending on pronunciation. Hana or hana, but don't ask me which is which because I've forgotten. Yeah, I, I, I heard no difference when you said it. <laughs> mm, that's because I'm still working on that part. So the translation is let me die in spring under the blossoming trees. Let it be around that full moon of Kisagari month. So, what is Kisagari? Okay, so there were old names for the months of the year. So, like right now, they're you know, Ichigatsu, Nigatsu, Sangatsu. The traditional names for the months were different. This is the name for February. In the Japanese calendar. So, around the time the cherry blossoms start to bloom, I thought it was usually around March, but apparently here it's February. So, I'm not sure if it, if it is the exact time of February or, or a little bit later.、Hmm. And according to the professor, he did tell me that Saigyo realized his wish and did die around the time of the cherry blossoms blooming. And in fact, if I go and look at his date of death, It's March 23rd, which would be around the time the cherry blossoms bloomed. So, a happy ending. We finally have a happy ending this episode. Hmm. I like your interpretation. I accept it. He died during the time that he wished most to die. Therefore, a happy ending in a way. No? I like your interpretation very much indeed. Okay. That's beautiful. So, I'm going to assume that that is it for our death poems for a while. You won't be doing another one next week. Right now, we are going to put the Jisei aside. And with a new topic next week, there will be a new poem theme. Okay. Well, I look forward to it and I look forward to whoever you find for the poem. I think that's going to about do it for us this week. Thank you for the poem. Like I said, we finally got a happy ending, at least in one of the stories this week. Sorry, my things were so depressing. No, we need to have. I know you didn't have... Really have much to say. We need to have. Everything. History is full of so many things. So we have to talk about as much as we can. So, no, thank you for that really nice perspective and a nice a fitting in to our two part show. Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Thomas. No, it's okay. As usual, thank you everyone for listening this week. We hope you found it interesting. Finishing off our, our theme of human sacrifice. So, yeah, if you visit any of these places, If you ever visit Japan, at least now you know some of the stories behind it and you can tell the people you're visiting with. So, yeah, thank you again, guys, for tuning in this week. We'll talk to you next time. Mata ne! Mata ne! If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at nexus underscore travels. That's N E X U S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Matane!